Hello, and welcome to Get Kids Coding. This webinar will cover the basics of IoT relating to kids and some ways to get them involved. Your presenters today are Al Manorino, the Principal Software Consultant, and he can be reached at al.manorino at embarcadero.com, and also myself, Mary Kelly, another software consultant here at Embarcadero, and you can reach out to me at mary.kelly at embarcadero.com. On our agenda today, we have a lot to discuss on the fundamentals of IoT and ways to incorporate and interact with children. We'll touch on how to set up some family coding time to share your programming experience, what IoT is and how it works, some ways you can get kids interested in IoT, and what you can teach them, before heading into a few demonstrations of some IoT projects that you can do at home. To get us started, a family-oriented hour of code gives you the opportunity to engage your kids with activities that combine the skills of programming with creativity and innovation that feeds the imagination, and there are a ton of various resources and activities available for setting aside just an hour here or there to help foster these programming skills. So let's talk about how to get started. One of the easiest places to start is with your current experience. What programming languages do you use? What made you start programming in the first place? Was it just your career? Or was it that you found an interest or a passion in programming and in logic? We're all really busy people with a million and one things to do. So finding an hour to program or teach your child how to program can be a bit of a hassle. But finding some time that works for everyone, just an hour, maybe an hour and a half, including pre and post setup and takedown on any day at any time is really all you need. Do your kids have any experience dabbling in programming? Or are they just beginners? How old are they? Today, most children have decent working knowledge of computers and technology without really having any formal education on the subject, so this can help you in determining what and how to go about your hour of code. Next, you can figure out the platform that you'll be working with. Computers or tablets are a typical first start and easy way to start programming with your kids. But a lot of toys on the market today have some kind of mobile application or SAS backend for feedback or for movement. So you can take a look at this to see if any of those allow for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity and show your kids some of the ways that they can design their favorite toy or robot to do different things. This leads us to determining what to actually do for your session. Are you going to do one big hour-long project, or do you think your kids will get bored too quickly with that and need to split it up into two or even three activities? Are your kids sports fanatics? Do they like games? Are they more artsy? Maybe they like cooking. Find a hobby of theirs, or just something that you think would be interesting to them. It doesn't have to be a problem out of an old comp sci textbook sitting at your desk. There are several websites and pre-made kits out there that provide themed, self-guided, and parent-guided sessions to get your kids programming by having them follow or think out different procedures to make something happen. This leads us to determining what to actually do for your session. Are you going to do one big hour-long project, or do you think your kids will get bored too quickly with that and need to split it up into two or even three activities? Are your kids sports fanatics? Do they like games? Are they more artsy? Maybe they like cooking. Find a hobby of theirs, or just something that you think would be interesting to them. It doesn't have to be a problem out of an old comp sci textbook sitting at your desk. There are several websites and pre-made kits out there that provide themed, self-guided, and parent-guided sessions to get your kids programming by having them follow or think out different procedures to make something happen. When you prep for your first family hour of code, the idea of setting up something fun can be both easy and daunting. You may have so many ideas come to mind, but when you think about your kids' ages and their experience level and how much prep you would have to do beforehand to get everything set up, 
it can easily become more of a hassle than a fun, easygoing activity that happens to also be educational. Planning and collecting supplies can be as easy as ordering a simple all-in-one kit and installing some software on their computers and tablets to purchasing Raspberry Pis or Arduino microprocessors and kits. Should you choose to use online resources for your code session, many provide sample scripts and timetables that you can follow for your first few lessons that you can personalize to your kids. Many provide some great analogies that make it a little bit easier to explain to your kids the fundamentals without using words like classes, objects, inheritance. Start off the first few minutes talking about what you like about programming, or again, what got you interested in the first place. Maybe you saw a computer game and were inspired, or you just liked the logic involved in coding. If you're a computer science BS or a programmer in your career, talk about some of the cool projects that you've been able to work on or how you solved a specific problem with programming. There are a few extra tips as well that I want to mention. Keep it simple. There's really no use in overcomplicating an hour of code when you're the only one doing the planning and getting supplies. You'll thank yourself and your kids won't feel overwhelmed with any projects. Work together. Help them figure things out. Answer questions as they come up. In conjunction with keeping it simple, spend less time talking about what you're going to do and spend more time actually doing it. Hands-on learning is one of the most successful ways to teach any subject and programming is really no different. You really want to have something tangible at the end of your session whether that may be a program that they've written and can execute to do something or a physical product that they can play with all the time. Keep to activities that can provide some quick feedback now as you can always plan another session to expand upon what you've already built. And I really want to reiterate that the success to an hour of code isn't really measured by how much gets done or what programming language your children learn. It's measured by the interest that you instill during these sessions. Getting kids interested in programming or building something is more than half the battle. Once you have that interest, there's this sense of self-pride that they receive from accomplishing that task, and they'll strive to do more. You don't have to stay plugged in if you don't want to. There are several ways to introduce programming concepts. The basic principle behind programming is to create some sort of instruction for the computers to follow to make something happen or how to interact with a user. This is something that children in school already understand, following the instructions given. Maybe this time, have them be the ones to write out instructions on how to do or use something Ask them about their thoughts on what they would do to control something they really like with software if they had to build it and what functionality that they would want it to have. And you could work out how to derive procedures from there. Next up, the Internet of Things. So what is the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is also known as IoT. And it's really just the connection of everyday objects to the internet and to each other, with the idea of using these objects to increase efficiency and provide more reliable data. So connecting you to the internet. Any person can connect at any time with any device at any place using any backend service. IoT consists of sensors or objects that take the readings, your choice of connectivity, like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and of course, some form of software that will control the functionality of your things. And IoT is really everywhere. You'll find it in retail, in self-driving cars and drones, security, in your home, in the media, healthcare, and managing energy usage. It has the potential for many more industries and several more uses, in fact, it may be easier for me to tell you who isn't utilizing the Internet of Things. How does IoT work? Devices and sensors collect and send a large variety of data that they amass through gateways. 
that act kind of like a bridge to networks so that your data can be passed to your cloud platform or data center where the data is then processed using analytics to create useful information that can be visualized, filtered, and reported on by other applications. The information can then be acted upon by mobile devices, other machines, and additional systems that allow you to control and monitor the devices and sensors from remote locations. And information that's actually deemed important by either the software platform or the end user can be pushed to your smartphone and you can also send back commands to those devices. IoT really starts with the sensors or devices that you choose to use and these are your things. So a sensor is really just a device that detects changes in its environment and then produces some kind of output to acknowledge the fact that there is a change in the quantity. Sensors then translate that change into an electrical signal that can be transmitted and interpreted by a gateway. Now many IoT devices like your smartphones, light bulbs, Fitbits, and so on have a lot of these sensors that can register changes in temperature, light, pressure, and motion. After figuring out sensors and devices, your hardware, this brings us to the topic of your communication layer. There's an abundance of technologies around, so it takes a little time to figure out which one's going to be best for you. A goal of IoT is to make lives easier, so choosing your communications and devices is extremely important depending on your needs. The devices that you use may have data requirements that vary from small updates to large amounts of updates like real-time videos and ranges can vary depending on industry requirements. The simplest options are Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. When you have thousands of these tiny sensors out there and they all require batteries that last for years or may not even have their own IP address, Wi-Fi is not going to cut it, and you're going to need something like Bluetooth. Bluetooth LE is probably the most commonly used wireless communication today between devices, and it's highly suitable for simple change updates and data that operate for long periods of time. Many of the devices that utilize Bluetooth LE include things like heart rate monitors and smartwatches. Bluetooth devices send signals via radio frequency, so they require gateways to help them access the internet. When you connect two or three of these devices, you just have to press a button. If you don't need to send large files, live video, or if your application only needs to pair to one or a few devices, then Bluetooth is really all you need. But the option to use Wi-Fi is typically best in in-building communications that require intensive bandwidth strain, as you can offer higher data rates and more reliability, like home automation and security systems, as well as building energy management. If you have a lot of data and big files, again, like those videos, then Wi-Fi is a better bet, offering more speed depending on some other factors, and when on specific network domains can offer a good level of user security. So when you don't have to worry about a high energy drain and your devices are constantly plugged in, then Wi-Fi can also be effective. There are several ways to get kids interested in programming. There are organizations and other groups whose mission is to literally get kids coding. Some ways to get your kids coding include programming tutorials, coding boot camps, engaging games that teach fundamental programming, and just building something that they can see and feel. It's even easier if what they build is something that they're interested in. It takes away the idea that they're learning to code and shows them that programming is just one of the many ways that to get something accomplished.
The easiest way to make IoT kid-friendly is to ask questions. The point to IoT is to make life easier, solving real-life everyday challenges. And even kids have challenges that they wish were easier to accomplish. Find some scenarios that you can explore with them. Building a robot to help clean their room or automating something at school. Even IoT projects that seem too advanced for children can be made K-12 using some of your own creativity to develop ideas that kids can grasp. Just work with them and start small. And now I'll pass the mic over to Al with a few demos of some IoT projects you can do. Thank you, Mary, for that wonderful introduction on what is IoT and how does IoT work and how to set up a family code hour. Next, let's take a look at a few examples on how you can use Rad Studio, Delphi, and or C++ Builder to build IoT connected applications for Windows, Mac OS X, iOS, Android, gadgets, and wearables. We'll look at two examples. For the first example, we'll use a Zephyr Bluetooth LE heart rate monitor to show how to collect heart rate beats per minute data. And for the second example, we'll use a Texas Instruments sensor tag to show how to collect temperature, humidity, and accelerometer data. And hopefully, these sample demos will get you thinking about other great ideas of what you can do with Bluetooth LE and IoT projects that you can build and create with your kids. Let's now look at Rad Studio Bluetooth LE component. Both C++ and Object Pascal has runtime library API for Bluetooth LE low energy, also called Bluetooth Smart. The runtime library has a unit called system.bluetooth and it provides a multi-device API to access the Bluetooth features of the device that is running your application. This new unit provides support for both classic Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy. Now the component has these properties and these events that we see on this slide. And in a few moments, we'll take a look at an application and see how to use these properties and events. So basically, you'll drop the Bluetooth LE component onto the form. Then we can call its discover devices method. And for example, with this syntax, we can scan for two and a half seconds looking for any devices and or gadgets that are heart rate service. Then all of the Bluetooth LE devices, sensors and or gadgets within range will get discovered. And then we can select the one we want to use. Then we can get all of the services, characteristics, and descriptors of the device, sensor, or the gadget. Let's now look at how we can use the new Rad Studio Bluetooth LE component to capture heart rate beats per minute from a Bluetooth LE heart rate monitor. So for this example, I'm going to be using a Zephyr smart heart rate monitor, but any Bluetooth LE gadget, device, or sensor that has a Bluetooth LE uh, heart rate service should also work. So for this app, to build it as a connected app and create a distributed Internet of Things solution, we have a client application to collect the heart rate beats per minute data and also graph the historical beats per minute data on another tab. Uh, we added a backend as a service cloud service to handle authentication and database services to store the data. And then we added a separate medical administration app that gets push notifications whenever a patient's heart rate beats per minute exceeds their recommended threshold. So the responsible medical team can immediately take the necessary medical action for the patient. So now this scenario, it can be used in hospitals, clinics, and even be used in fitness centers. So with these types of, of personal heart rate monitors, you can now work out smarter in your gyms or your fitness centers. Physiologists and fitness trainers recommend working out within certain heart rate zones to achieve goals such as weight loss or cardiovascular improvement you no longer have to hold on to those dirty handlebars on treadmills. 
in a gym because these new Bluetooth LE heart rate monitors continuously monitors you for faster feedback. So now let's take a look at the app inside of Rad Studio and see how we added Bluetooth LE with backend as a service for push notifications uh, to these applications. So here is Rad Studio with the heart rate monitor and remote push notification apps. We have these apps in both Object Pascal and C++. Here we're going to be using the Object Pascal version. So let me quickly explain what these apps do. Then I'll run the apps and then we'll come back into the IDE and we'll walk through the code and see how they were created. So we have two projects here. Project 1 is the heart rate monitor and project 2 is the remote push notification project. So for the heart rate monitor we have two forms. One is the login form and the other is the heart rate form. So from the login form we allow the user to log in against a predefined backend as a service user account and once they log in we have a second tab that will let them set their threshold based on what their doctor or their personal trainer recommends it should be and if your heart rate exceeds that threshold then a push notification is going to be sent to this other remote push notification app so your medical and or your training professional knows the name of the user and their current heart rate. On the login form for the back end as a service provider for our user authentication and to store our heart rate data we're using a Kinvi provider component a back end storage component and a back end users component after logging in and setting the heart rate threshold we then display the heart rate form to show our heart rate beats per minute now on the heart rate form we're using our Bluetooth LE component to get our heart rate from the heart rate monitor. For the back end as a service, we have our Kinvi provider, a back end query component, a back end storage component. Now we also have a REST response dataset adapter component, and we see it's bound to a FireDAC memory table, an FD mem tab table component as our dataset. And this gets the response JSON from the backend query component. And we have a backend push component with a push endpoint called my message that lets us use business logic in the cloud to send push notifications to the other separate administration app if we get a heart rate above the threshold. On another tab that we call the history tab, we added a chart and here we're using the t-chart component to graphically display the heart rate recorded data and lastly on the settings tab we display the Bluetooth heart rate monitor information we get the name of the heart rate monitor the sensor connection information with body location of the heart rate sensor and if the heart rate monitor is connected for its contact status. The second project that we call Remote Push, this is our heart rate cloud administrator application. It has just one form and it's designed for the medical professional or the health club trainer. So this is the app that's going to receive the push notifications for the users that have heart rates above the threshold that we set on the heart rate application. So it has two components. It has the same Kinvey provider component with the same settings that we set on the heart rate monitor app. And we also added a push events component. And it has the same push event property called my message that we defined inside our Kinvey backend as a service backend. Let's now deploy and run these apps and see what they do. Now these are multi-device applications, so we have our choice to deploy them to either iOS, Android, Mac OS X, and or Windows. So for my heart rate monitor, I'm going to choose to deploy it 
to an iOS device. Uh, it'll be an iOS uh, 8.1 to an iPad. And for our admin push notification app, uh, I'm going to choose to deploy that to, to Android, an Android Nexus 7 tablet. So let me now build and deploy these two apps, and we'll see what they look like. So here we see the two apps running on the devices. The heart rate monitor is running on this iOS iPad. And the heart rate cloud administrator is running on an Android Nexus 7 tablet. And I'm wearing my Zephyr heart rate monitor on my chest. So now I'm going to log in as myself. It now does the authentication to the cloud, and that worked great. Now I need to set my beats per minute notification threshold. Now a healthy resting heart rate is somewhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Now a highly conditioned athlete, they often have resting heart rate somewhere between 40 and 60 beats per minute. But I'm not one of them, so I'm going to set my threshold to be about 100. So now I can push the scan button, and now it waits about four seconds, looking for all the Bluetooth LE devices. And once it finds my heart rate monitor, it will connect to it. And then we should start uh, receiving data from it, and we should see my heartbeat beats per minute. So right now I'm at a nice comfortable 99. So let me stand up and do some running in place to try to get it past 100. And we did. So now it's past 100. So it immediately sent the push notifications to the Heart Rate Cloud Administrator app, letting either my medical folks and or my personal trainer in my gym know that my heart rate is higher than it should be, so they can now take the necessary corrective actions. And on the, on the heart rate monitor, we have separate tabs on the bottom, one for history. So if I look at the history tab, it's going to display my historical uh, beats per minute uh, on a graph. So we see that. And I also added that memo box on the bottom to display uh, heart rate, you know, Bluetooth LE data. So you can see all the, uh, the UUIDs for, for the heart rate, the heart rate measurement, uh, body sensor location. So all of the descriptors and all of the characteristics uh, are displayed on that memo box and the last tab the settings here's where we can get information on the on the heart rate monitor so if I wanted to know for example what type of heart rate monitor I'm connected to uh, in my case it's my Zephyr heart rate meter I get sensor connection information so sensor location it knows uh, I'm wearing it on my chest and sensor contact has been uh, detected so all of that is working great. So now let's go back into the IDE and I'll walk you through the code and we'll see how we created these apps. We do have a detailed write-up on how we created these apps including setting up the backend as a service using Kinvey and setting up the cloud and messaging services for the push notifications. So you'll be able to read the white papers for all of the details. Looking at the heart rate monitor project, it consists of two forms, the login form and the heart rate form. On the login form, this allows the user to log in against a predefined backend as a service user account that we created using Kinvey. On Kinvey, I created a new app called My Backend as a Service app, and in that app, I created my users. So Al was the username I used to log into our heart rate monitor. And we used the backend as a service to authenticate the username and the password. After we log in, we go to the threshold tab where we can set our beats per minute notification threshold based on what our doctor or our personal trainer tells us. And then when our heart rate exceeds that threshold, then a push notification gets sent to the heart rate cloud administration app, 
letting them know the name of the user and their current heart rate. To enable the backend as a service, we have a Kinvey provider component, a backend storage component, and a backend users component. Now both the backend users component and the backend storage component are connected to the Kinvey provider as their provider property. On the Kenvey provider component, from the Kenvey app we created, we set the app key, the app secret key, and the master secret. And we have a username and a password. We will use this username and password to be the same one assigned to the app that's going to receive the push notifications. So this will either be the admin or the medical professional who's going to receive our beats per minute if we exceed the threshold. Looking at the on click event for the set button, here we see we create a new JSON object and we are adding two new JSON pairs. One for the threshold from the number box and the username from the login screen. And then we create a new JSON object that contains both of those JSON pairs and then we create a new data collection that we're calling heart rate user data on the back end as a service uh, using Kenvey. Now the collection is going to have two columns, one called threshold and the other one called username. And it's going to store the threshold value we entered in the number box and the username from the login. And then we display that the threshold gets set and then we hide the login form and then we display the uh, heart rate monitor form. Now if we look at our Kenvey account under data we see our data collection that we created heart rate user data and it has the username and the threshold that we set. Looking at the heart rate form this is our main application it also has a Kenvey provider component with the same property set as the login form it has a backend storage component for storing all the new heart rate data we'll be receiving from the heart rate monitor. We have a backend query component that will look at my Kinvey backend using this new heart rate cloud data collection that's going to get created in Kinvey when I scan for my heart rate. And as soon as I scan for the heart rate and get a beats per minute, then we're going to write to this new data collection that we're going to call heart rate cloud and we'll store the current heart rate and the time for that heart rate in the data collection. Now this backend query component is able to retrieve that stored data in the cloud. On the history tab we have a list view that is bound to the backend query component to display the historical data. Now if we look at visual live bindings we see that we have visually bound the list view to the beats per minute log and to its text property and the time to the detail property on the list view. And these are going to be the two JSON pairs that we're going to create. And on this history tab we also added a chart using the included uh, t-chart components to, uh, to graphically display the recorded data. And on the settings tab, here's where, would, here's where we can display the Bluetooth heart rate monitor information. We're going to get the name of the heart rate monitor, uh, the sensor connection info with the body location of the heart rate sensor, and if the heart rate monitor is connected uh, for its contact status. And last, and just as important, we're going to be using our Bluetooth LE component with this application. Looking into the code, one of the first things we needed to do for this Bluetooth LE app was to get the Bluetooth UUID uh, for a heart rate service. So from the Bluetooth website under Home Get Specifications Services service viewer, we're able to find the service that exposes heart rate and other data from a heart rate sensor. 
and that service exposes the heart rate monitors beats per minute and other data and the heart rate sensor is using one of the standard Bluetooth GAT profiles. The next thing we did and again from the Bluetooth website under GAT specifications characteristics was to get the heart rate measurement characteristics and body sensor location UUIDs and the body sensor location characteristic value is used to index this array to display the string of where the user is wearing the heart rate monitor. On the heart rate form when we click on the scan button we perform do scan and here we call the Bluetooth LE discover devices method we scan for two and a half seconds looking for heart rate service devices. At the end of this two and a half second timeout scanning looking for devices from the Bluetooth LE component then the on and discover devices events gets fired and here we get the list of all discovered Bluetooth LE heart rate service devices that we found. Next we can get the service and characteristics from our devices. And here we can find and list of all the available services and characteristics and we can search for specific ones such as heart rate and monitor position. Then we can subscribe to the characteristics and we can do that by calling the Bluetooth LE component its method called uh, subscribe to characteristic. And once we start receiving data from the device, the on characteristic read event gets fired. And here we can start collecting data and display it on our user interface. Now, to manage the characteristic data, we have a method called manage characteristic data. And here we could check to see if the characteristic is a uh, heart rate measurement beats per minute and if it is we have a method called display heart rate measurement data where we can take the beats per minute data and display it on the label on our heart rate monitor app. To save our data to the cloud we added a new method called save in background and what this method does is it's using threading to execute and store the continuous heart rate data in the cloud while you are processing the data. So here we're also using the new parallel programming library for background processing to store the data as it's being retrieved. So this way with multiple threads and the parallel programming library we can continue to use the user interface as data is being stored in the background. So that's great. In this method we create a few variables so we so we can record the heart rate with the timestamp and then we add several JSON pairs for the beats per minute log and that's our current heart rate the current time and the last one for the username and that's the username we get from the login form so we create several JSON pairs in this save in background method and again we're using the new parallel programming library task method and here we're going to create a brand new data collection called heart rate cloud in our Kinvey uh, backend service and it's going to have the three columns the BPM log time and the username and this all uses the backend storage component so that's also great looking into our Kinvey account for our My Backend as a Service app, we have our two data collections, one called Heart Rate Cloud and the other one called Heart Rate User Data. For the Heart Rate Cloud data collection, we have our three items, Beats Per Minute Log, the Timestamp, and our Username. And if these two data collections don't exist, they get created for us once we run the app. On the Measure tab, we use this label to display our heart rate beats per minute and we have a list view that displays our heart rate data. 
And here in code is where we display the current heart rate on the label and add the heart rate data to the list view. And if our heart rate data exceeds our threshold, then we send a push notification using the back end push component. We send a title and a message. The back end push component also uses the Kinvey provider as its provider. And the Kinvey provider on this heart rate form has a push endpoint property called my message. Now this lets us use business logic that lives in the cloud on Kenvey that uses JavaScript to let us send push notifications if we get a heart rate above the threshold. So it's a push trigger that we can execute any time your heart rate exceeds the threshold. On the Kenvey account, here's the JavaScript we added to my message to send the push notifications. The form also has a timer component and if we look at the on timer event it says that if our active tab is the history tab then we update the graph every second so you will see continuous data on the graph in the history tab as we are retrieving data from the heart rate monitor. The last component we want to look at is this rest response data set adapter that's bound to a FireDAC FD mem table. Now the FD mem table is connected to the rest response data set adapter. If we look at the properties of the FD mem table, we see that we're using the FD mem table as a data set from the data set property of the rest response data set adapter and the response JSON is set to the back end query component. We then store the data we get from the cloud in our FD mem table and we are able to bind it to our list view to be able to display data from the cloud and display the historical data in the list view also. And if we look at the live bindings designer we see that our FD mem table is bound to our list view so we can display the beats per minute and the time. So that's great. Next let's quickly look at the remote push application. So this is our heart rate cloud admin application. So it's been designed to be used by the medical staff or your fitness trainer to monitor your heart rate. So this app receives the push notification that the admin will receive once the heart rate exceeds the predefined beats per minute threshold that we set on the heart rate form for a specific user. Now to be able to send the push notification to the medical staff, uh, we have two components. We have the Kinvey provider component with the same settings that we defined on the heart rate monitor project. And we have our push endpoint property with our my message on this Kinvey provider. And that's needed in both the heart rate app and this remote push app. And then we saw on the Kenvey uh, account, on the business logic, we saw the JavaScript code that we added for the push notifications. And lastly, we have a push events component that also gets linked to our Kinvey provider. And we defined an event called on push received. And for this event, we're going to add text to our list view items. And we will show the name of the user plus their current heart rate and we send this notification to the medical staff. So that was a quick code walkthrough on how we added Bluetooth LE, uh, back end as a service, and push notifications to these applications. Let's look at another example of using this Bluetooth LE component because with the proliferation of devices, gadgets, wearables, and the Internet of Things, we as developers, we need to learn how to connect our existing and new multi-device applications to Bluetooth low energy devices. So let's look at how to get temperature, humidity, and accelerometer data from a Bluetooth LE device. So for this example, I'm going to be using this Texas Instruments CC2541 microcontroller. 
It's a power optimized true system on a chip solution for both Bluetooth low energy and proprietary 2.4 gigahertz applications. And only for about $25 US you can purchase from Texas Instruments there Simple Link sensor tag that has the microcontroller with six different sensors. So you can use this for temperature, humidity, pressure, accelerometer, gyroscope, and a magnetometer. So for this for this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to get data from the temperature, humidity, and accelerometer sensors. So here's the app running on an iOS device. Now when the Bluetooth LE device is on, it starts to advertise the services it offers. So if I click on the Find Devices button, it will scan for a few seconds looking for Bluetooth LE devices. And if it finds our sensor tag, like it did right here, I can select it. And then I can click subscribe to data. Now when I click subscribe to data, this tells the device that we are ready to receive all the data that we are requesting. So for this example, we are looking for the ambient and target temperature, the humidity, and any accelerometer data. So for example, we could use the accelerometer data to let us know if the patient is moving inside of the room. So similar as we did with the heart rate monitor, if we, mon if we wanted to monitor the patient's uh, high temperature, we could check to see if the target temperature is above normal body temperature. So let's say between 36.5 degrees Celsius to 37.2 degrees Celsius for a healthy ad adult. Here's the app in Rad Studio, and looking at the code, we see we are using the Bluetooth LE component that does all the work for us. It has great methods for discovering devices and their services and characteristics. You can read and write data from the characteristics using this Bluetooth LE component and subscribe to the data. It has these great events that we can use. So for example, the on end discover devices event when we call our uh, discovered devices with a timeout at the end of the timeout this on end discovered devices event gets fired and we get a list of discovered Bluetooth devices and then usually the next event after the on end discovered devices is to call the on end discover services and that will give us a list of services for the device that we selected the on characteristics read event gets fired each time a device is sent to us and the on characteristic read request event is when we are implementing a GAT service. Same with the characteristic write and characteristic write request. When we click on the find devices button, we start the discovery process by calling the Bluetooth LE discover devices method. We scan in this case for four seconds looking for Bluetooth devices and at the end of this four seconds, then the on and discover devices event gets fired. And on the on and discover devices event, here we are storing the name of the device that we want to discover. So in our case, we want to find a device named sensor tag. And when we read from its documentation, uh, the device name can be a different name on different operating systems. So once we have the sensor tag, we add it to our list box. We select the sensor tag from the list box, and then we click on subscribe to data. And here's where we call the Bluetooth LE discover services method with the current device that we just selected. This causes the on and discover services event to be fired. And here is where we scan for all the services that we find. And if the services are the ones we want, like the temperature service, humidity service, and the accelerometer service, we can get their data. Now looking at the documentation for the sensor tag, we do some operations in order to receive the data. So for example, for the temperature service, the documentation says we need to find this characteristic called UUIDIRTCONF. And once we find it, we set the value of the characteristic to 1. And then we can call the Bluetooth LE write characteristic method 
to write this value to the device. And that tells the device to start sending the data of the temperature service, both the ambient and the target temperature. We do the same operations for the humidity service and for the accelerometer service. So we scan the services, searching for services by its UUID name. And then from its documentation, we need to find the characteristics. So for example, for the accelerometer service, we need to find its characteristic. And then we set its characteristic value to 1. And then we write this value to the device by calling the write characteristic method of the Bluetooth LE component. And this makes the device, our sensor tag, start sending data to us. And then the on characteristic read event gets fired. And here is where we can filter the data and translate the values that the device is sending to us. Reading the documentation on the sensor tag, we can see how we can translate the data into the real data that we will be displaying on the user interface. So for example, to get the ambient temperature, you know, we can see the calculation here. So we do the same for the humidity and the accelerometer. And that's how you can use Rad Studio Bluetooth LE component to get temperature, humidity, and accelerometer data from a Bluetooth LE sensor. I hope you enjoyed those past two demonstrations on how to code Bluetooth LE devices for the Internet of Things, and hopefully those sample demonstrations got you thinking about other great ideas of what you can do with Bluetooth LE and IoT projects that you can build and create with your kids. Now let me turn this presentation back over to Mary to discuss some other IoT projects to consider. There are a lot of IoT projects that you can build with your kids to help them understand IoT and Bluetooth LE devices. Here are just two follow-up projects using the TI sensor tag with the temperature sensor. Build an Arduino 101 data logger with the TI sensor tag. Now this is a kid-friendly project to build a Bluetooth LE data logging system that takes readings from the TI sensor tag sensors and saves that data to an SD memory card. Basically the logger will read the temperature sensor data and then record the readings over time. And the what is the ideal temperature setting for refrigerators lab. This cool science project in microbiology is designed for 6th to 9th graders and it demonstrates how temperature settings affect bacterial growth. So you can answer questions like what temperature inhibits bacterial growth and does this vary from different food items? In addition, Rad Studio, Delphi, and or C++ Builder includes a feature called the Get It Package Manager that provides packages to support over 50 Bluetooth LE devices in your applications listed on this DocWiki web link for ThingConnect underscore devices. So building IoT solutions requires data to flow between devices, gadgets, the connected app, and the internet. Embarcadero Technologies streamlines application development by, by providing an easy to use components based solution for Bluetooth, Wi Fi, and REST communication protocols. Now, some of the kid focused IoT devices available via the Get It Package Manager are listed here on this slide. For example, the, the Be Safe Buddy. This is a Bluetooth LE key fob for item tracking with an alarm function built in. The Mayo Gesture Control. This is a great kid friendly device. It's a device that reads the electrical activity of your muscles and the motion of your arm to let you wirelessly control technology with hand gestures and motion. You can also look at using the Lifetrack Move Fitness Watch. This is a great device for anyone that monitors their fitness level. And we can also look at the TI sensor tag that we just saw in the last demonstration. This TI sensor tag is really a cool gadget 
with lots of possibilities. Resources. Here are some additional resources to help get kids coding. At the organization level, take a look at the code.org website. The code.org site is a nonprofit dedicated to expanding access to computer science in schools. On the websites, take a look at the Ed Surge's Guide site. This site is dedicated to teaching kids to code. And lastly, there are many platforms to help get your kids and yourself excited about coding, such as Tinker, Hopscotch, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and Lego Mindstorm. And Lego Mindstorm has building sets that contain the tools to start teaching STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and computer science to your kids. And definitely take a look at the Rad Studio Doc Wiki for Bluetooth LE support. This Doc Wiki page has detailed information on how you can implement Bluetooth LE support for standard services in your applications. This ends what we had time to cover on this Get Kids Coding webinar to introduce you to IoT and some ideas on how to set up and teach kids about IoT and programming. Let's now open up this webinar to any questions you might have.